Hi, my name's Drew, and I'm going to be walking you through the Envision 21 QBS by Golfstream today. Uh, starting right up front here, we're going to go over the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, what we have at the front of the tongue here is going to be your coupler lock. Uh, so, idea being is we are going to raise this, uh, use the electric tongue jack here to raise the coupler three inches above your ball and drop. We are then going to center our ball and drop underneath the coupler. We're then going to go ahead and lower that jack down or that coupler on top of that ball, uh, again utilizing that jack. Uh, once we are fully seated, we're going to go ahead and slide this latch forward. Uh, we're paying special attention that both vampire teeth here are fully engaged there on the frame. A uh, very good idea to go back and go ahead and pin these holes here with a secondary pin, uh, whether that's going to be a coupler lock or a uh, spring pin, whatever you have, uh, nut and bolt, whatever you have is better than nothing. Of course, the unit does not come standard with one of those, so uh, that would be a very worthy upgrade. Uh, so from there, we're, we're locked onto the ball, uh, coupled up here. We're going to go ahead and raise that jack up all the way uh, out of the way. So once that jack is in the resting position, we're good there. We're going to go ahead and take our toe chains. We will cross those underneath the coupler and hook them onto the receiver of the vehicle. Uh, paying special attention that they are, number one, crossed underneath the coupler and that they're not going to make contact with the pavement at any time. It is illegal in the state of Texas uh, for these chains to be uncrossed as well for them to make contact with the pavement at any time. So we do want to make sure we're skating that line of having enough room to make our turns left or right, but not so much room that they may again contact the pavement. Uh, riding right next to those tow chains is going to be your emergency breakaway cable. Now this cable corresponds with the electric brakes. This is essentially a, a very important safety feature. Uh, if these couplers were to fail and the vehicles, uh, as the vehicles disconnected, it's going to pull this like a ripcord, uh, essentially locking up the electric brakes to avoid a uh, runaway camping scenario. Uh, it is very important that you use a carabiner or a quick link or uh, something to connect this separately to your receiver. Uh, so again, three points of contact, two for your tow chains, one for your emergency breakaway. Uh, very straightforward stuff there. Uh, we're going to have your uh, seven-way receptacle here. This is going to plug directly into the bumper of your vehicle. This is going to give you full function to your vehicle's uh, tow, uh, your vehicle's braking system, charging system, as well as your tail lights, marker lights, things like that. Uh, hopping up here to the electric jack, we have a uh, Light switch there, easy on off. That's going to give you a point of reference if you are backing up to the unit at dark, as well as go ahead and, and uh, light this space if you are doing any of that uh, procedure we just spoke of after dark. Uh, also, you have a up or down operation here on the jack to of course raise that up or down, very straightforward. Uh, back behind there uh, in this hole, we have a uh, a manual drive option. So if you, in the event that you do have a power loss situation, you can go ahead and utilize this crank handle, go ahead and line that up with the drive nut there on the inside. That will allow you to uh, manipulate this up or down. Uh, directly behind all that, we have two 20 pound propane cylinders. These will be full for you when you do pick up the unit. Uh, open and close valve here on the top. I find most people are somewhat familiar uh, with the operation of these cylinders. Uh, now when it does come to go ahead and removing these, you're going to uh, loosen this wing nut here. Uh, once we go ahead and remove that, we'll then go ahead and disconnect the pigtails here on this regulator. We'll go ahead and slump that regulator out of the way, rotate this T-bar out of position. That will allow us to go ahead and remove those tanks to go ahead and take them to be uh, serviced. Uh, in between there, we have your regulator. Uh, now this regulator is uh, going to be directionalized towards whatever tank you want to draw off of first. If you have both of these service valves in the open position, once you have uh, exhausted one tank, it is going to automatically uh, switch over to the other. Uh, now, if you want to avoid that from happening, keep your primary tank valve open, secondary tank valve in the closed position. Once you've exhausted all of the propane within your primary tank, you're then going to have to manually switch this over and then open that secondary service valve. Uh, this is all covered by your propane cover here. Uh, it does just slip over top of those tanks. Uh, orientation is going to be with the, the opening of the door uh, towards the rear. That way it's not going to uh, catch any wind or anything like that uh, again when, when going down the road. Uh, behind that we have a deep cycle interstate battery. 
Uh, this is a wet cell or flooded battery. So what that means for you is two or three times a year, we're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels. We're going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So there is gonna be a clear marks water level and it is just our goal to maintain that water level uh, focused on the hottest of months. Uh, other than that, uh, for periods of long-term storage, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and disconnect these battery terminals, whether that be utilizing a battery disconnect switch or physically disconnecting them from the battery. That's gonna help keep any nominal or phantom draws uh, within any 12 volt system from wearing and tearing on the battery uh, compounded over many months in storage. Uh, so just a couple things to think about there uh, as we move on. Uh, we do have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. Uh, now those are for stabilization, they're not for leveling. We're gonna use the included crank handle here. Uh, we're going to place that over the three quarter inch drive nut. We're going to come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more. Now for leveling from front to back, we're gonna use that main tongue jack we just finished talking about. If we're leveling from left to right, we're gonna use the tires in a leveling kit. Uh, they have a multitude of different leveling options on the market, but all of them are basically going to uh, utilize the tires in either a ramp or a stackable blocks, uh, something to attain a level. Once you are certain of your level, you're then going to come down with your stabilizer jack and again, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Something like that. Uh, and again, once you make contact, uh, just shore it up, same on the way up. You don't need to go overly tight in either direction. They're not gonna work themselves up or down. Uh, snug is better than overly tight. Uh, here in the large pass-through storage compartment, we have lights on each side. If we tap that center lens on the light, that's gonna turn that on or off. So what we have here is going to be your Schwintec system. Uh, what that does is that use two independently geared motors to push that slide in and out. Uh, it's very important that we maintain those properly. Uh, what you see here is going to be tracks top to bottom. You'll have a corresponding set of tracks there on the other side. Uh, it's very important that we lubricate these tracks. Uh, every 90 days, we're going to get a can of dry silicone lubricant, PTFE lubricant, and we're gonna make sure we spray those tracks down. Uh, once we've sprayed them down, we're gonna run that slide in and out a couple times to distribute that lubricant, and we'll be good for the next 90 days. On that same maintenance schedule, we're gonna wanna condition these seals here. You have a set of seals that runs uh, 360 degrees around the slide out, as well as on the inside, you have another set of seals as well. Uh, generally, the directions of applying those products are going to be, again, spraying it down, letting it sit uh, and soak in for a period of time, wiping off the excess, and then again, you're gonna be good for the next 90 days. Uh, moving on here, we have your tires uh, and lug nuts. Now, lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. That's going to include the first 10, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. It is very important that we do go ahead and make sure those lug nuts are maintaining that torque. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after that you do check and make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, now tire pressure is going to be stamped on the sidewall of the tire. With any trailer tire we run those at the max. So you're going to find that not only on the sidewall of the tire but if we come to the forward side of the camper uh, you will find that right here. And it's going to be 75 PSI. That's going to be the max tire pressure rating. That's exactly where we want to run those tires. That's going to give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. Uh, whether we're completely full or completely empty, that 75 PSI is going to be a good number. So what we have here is going to be your 30 amp, 110 volt uh, power supply here. Uh, here with the Envision, it is hardwired into the unit. Uh, what I recommend for any unit that I deliver is going to be the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. Uh, that surge protector is going to plug directly into the power source. It's going to not only protect your shore cord, uh, as well as the uh, sensitive electronics within the unit from uh, surges, uh, substandard wiring, dirty power, any of those scenarios uh, are, are something that things that you can encounter uh, out there while camping, and the only way to protect yourself is going to be with the surge protector. Uh, if you have any questions on which products we recommend or how to use them, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and educate you further on those. Uh, dropping down low here, we have your cable satellite inlets. Those are just standard RG6 cable fittings. 
that will pass through to the designated TV area of the camper to feed either one of those services uh, again throughout the camper. Uh, very easy, very standard cable fitting. Uh, beside that, we have your city water connection. Now this is what you're going to go ahead and utilize in the capacity of an RV park or anywhere where you'd have uh, full-time running water. Now pressure becomes very important when we talk about the city water connection. It is very important that we do not overpressurize these units. Uh, when it comes to pressurizing these units, they are rated for a max 75 PSI water pressure. Uh, we include a water pressure regulator with your purchase. Now that's going to hook directly onto the spigot side uh, of the hose. And then of course we're going to just make sure you make your connection here with the water hose. Uh, it's important that we keep that, that regulator, uh, that, that weight uh, off of this uh, trailer bound connection because it is plastic. We want to keep as much weight off of that as necessary. Uh, again, water pressure becomes very, very important if your water pressure regulator gets lost. Uh, or damaged, uh, make sure you are uh, replacing that before taking the unit out. Uh, beside that, we have your spray port. Now this is going to utilize a quick connect uh, fitting. On the inside, you're going to find a, co uh, a, a corresponding uh, coiled sprayer hose. Uh, that becomes very easy to connect here, uh, and that's great if you're gonna be washing off any critters, washing your feet off, things like that. Uh, it is very usable. You're going to slide the locking collar back, insert the mail in fully, that's going to automatically pressurize and give you uh, use to water, uh, whether you are on city water connection or a potable connection. Uh, beside that, we have your black water flush. Uh, that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, one thing you do need to be careful of is that you don't overflow that black water holding tank. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and we're going to watch that tank fill up. Uh, to about two-thirds full before we're going to run out here and relieve that pressure on the blade X valve down here. It is very, very important that we do not overflow that black water tank uh, because there's no check valve or anything in line. Uh, the path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents and that wastewater will evacuate there if you do overflow the tank. Uh, down low here we have your dump valves. Uh, on the right is going to be your sewage holding tank or black water. On your left is going to be your wastewater holding tank or gray water. Of course, black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. And then we have a bayonet fi uh, fitting uh, separating the two. Now, especially here with the black water tank, it is very important that we keep that in the closed position. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside. Again, monitor that level and we are going to dump as it fills up. Uh, it's very important that we keep that in the closed position because we want that uh, solid waste, that toilet paper and body waste to be in as wet or flowing condition as we can uh, so it can easily evacuate the, the tank. Uh, these two valves should never be open at the same time. Treat it like a vacuum lock. A popular option is going to be dumping your black water valve fully, closing that, and then opening up the gray water valve uh, and allowing that to rinse any shared plumbing and your sewage hose on the way out. Now your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way this cap comes off. You have four prongs along the outside of that tube. We're going to lock the, uh, line the keyhole up in the halfway position, give it a quarter turn that's going to go ahead and lock everything on, make it usable. Again, keep the black water valve in the closed position until it is time to dump. Uh, also a little further back, if we go onto the upside of the camper here, uh, underneath that J-wrap, we have your uh, low point drains. Now these are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. So this is how we're going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. This is stop number one when it comes to draining the water. Uh, manufacturer recommends that if uh, the unit is going to be in storage in more than seven days, for more than seven days, that the unit is stored without any water inside. Uh, this is of course going to be where we drain first. We're then going to walk over to the water heater and drain that separately. We're going to get uh, in depth into that process when we do get to the water heater. Uh, moving on here to the rear. Uh, not too much going on back here. We of course have your tube bumper, uh, tube storage bumper. So each side has a cap. You can go ahead and store your sewage hose in there or any long storage you may have uh, would work well for that. Uh, we have a full size spare tire here on the unit. Uh, now when it does come to changing a tire, we're going to number one, make sure that the jack that is uh, with your tow vehicle is going to lift the axle out of the way enough to actually accommodate changing a tire. 
We're also going to make sure that your lug wrench is going to go ahead and fit these lug nuts with on the unit. Uh, very, very important that we do those things before we actually need to use them. Uh, once you do so, we're going to place that jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as we can without it interfering in our work. We're going to jack the tire up, of course, do our work as uh, safely as we can, and then, of course, replace that tire, that blown tire here on the rear, and we're going to switch them around. Very straightforward. Uh, other than that, you have tail lights, license plate bracket there. Uh, up top, we have marker lights, and we have a pre-wire for a backup camera. It's going to be an excellent addition. Uh, the makes the install very easy since it does come pre-wired uh, from Gulfstream. Next up is going to be your water heater. Uh, now the manufacturer has some very specific recommendations with this. Uh, of course, again, this is a six gallon capacity water heater. It is dual source. Uh, it's going to run on 110 volt electricity as well as propane gas with direct spark ignition. Uh, now manufacturer recommends Again, anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, that we do go ahead and drain this separately. It is very important that we follow the correct procedure to do so uh, because it becomes a safety uh, concern uh, from there. So uh, number one is we're going to give it ample time to cool down, two or three hours uh, at least. Uh, once we're fairly confident of the temperature, we need to depressurize it. Now we're going to use the hot side of any spigot on the inside or any fixture on the inside uh, of the unit. So uh, number one, you're going to, you're going to uh, cut the inflow of water to the unit. So if we're using the city water connection that we just talked about, we're going to physically turn that off at the fixture. And if we're utilizing potable water, we're going to uh, turn the water pump off on the inside. Uh, so once we have no new water flowing to the unit, uh, we are then going to uh, go ahead and depressurize the unit using the hot side of any fixture on the inside. Uh, very easily, just walk up to the fixture, turn the hot side of the knob on. You may see a little bit of water come out, a little bit of uh, you know, steam, whatever. Uh, that means that the, you have depressurized the unit and you can safely drain it from there. Uh, so once you've depressurized the unit, we're going to come here with an inch and a, an inch and a sixteenth uh, socket and extension and we're going to go ahead and back that drain plug out. Now that drain plug pulls double duty. It's not only your drain plug but it is also your anode rod. Uh, an anode rod is a three quarter inch by 12 inch piece of magnesium. Uh, acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto that anode rod as opposed to the inside of the water heater. It is a consumable part. Expect to get a year or two in between anode rod changes and you will be well aware of the condition because you're going to be draining, the, every time you drain the water heater, you're going to be uh, taking a look at that anode rod and you're going to be draining the anode rod anytime the unit is going to, or draining the water heater anytime uh, the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, now, once we've drained the water heater, uh, we're good to store it. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, returning the unit back to service, uh, it is very important that we do prime the water heater uh, which is essentially just introducing six gallons of water to the unit before we light it. Uh, to do so, uh, you're going to, uh, it's going to be a very similar process to depressurizing it, uh, but we're going to start by introducing an inflow to the unit overall. So again, if we're talking about city water connection, we're going to go physically turn that valve on. If we're talking about potable water, we're going to go ahead and turn that 12 volt uh, water pump on. So once we have water flushing in or flowing into the unit itself, uh, we're then going to again go to the hot side of the spigot. We're going to turn that hot side of that spigot on. Initially that flow is going to be very airy, very spitty. What it's doing is it's displacing the air within the holding tank here uh, and refilling it with water. Once that flow normalizes that, the fixture that is our indicator that we can go ahead and start heating our water uh, on whatever source we choose, whether that's going to be the toggle switch here for the 110 volt element or the uh, the flip the switch on the inside to control the propane with direct spark ignition. Uh, another recommendation is going to be uh, protecting the unit from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, as you can see here on the door, we have uh, some louvers uh, as well as some grating. Uh, mud daubers in particular are attracted to the smell of propane. Uh, what they would like more than anything else is to crawl within this uh, unit and make their dirt nest as close as they can uh, to the flow of propane. So it is very important we protect them from doing that. 
easiest way to accomplish that is going to be using the uh, aftermarket bug screens. Uh, down low here we have a uh, propane line that is going to also utilize that quick connect style fitting with that locking collar. Uh, you'll go ahead and of course with the valve here in the on position you can't connect or disconnect. Uh, so with the valve in the off position you can go ahead and slide that locking collar back. You're going to go ahead and insert the bail end fully. Uh, once fully inserted it's going to snap back. Uh, once it has, uh, once you are connected you turn that valve on the, the on position. That's going to be helpful to go ahead and feed propane to any high flow propane appliance, whether that's a gas grill, uh, propane fire pit, propane heater. Uh, all of those things will work out well uh, with that um, high flow propane connector. Uh, we have the back side of your refrigerator here. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, not too terribly much you're going to be doing from this location. It's not what we consider a customer serviceable unit and all your controls are going to be on the front side. So there's just not too terribly much you're going to be doing here from this compartment or this vent panel. Uh, but again, we do need to protect it uh, from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. Uh, other than screening these uh, vents off, it's very important that we do remove this vent cover and we give it a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure nothing's nesting in there. Uh, when we replace this vent, we're going to go ahead and take your uh, condensation hose and we're going to uh, feed that through one of these openings uh, that way if it does condensate at all it's going to evacuate towards the uh, exterior of the unit we line up these tabs along the bottom edge it's going to put us in line to uh, line these prongs up once we've done so we're going to give these an eighth inch turn to the right that's going to go ahead and lock them on. Uh, and of course, after that, I always go back and give it a tug there uh, to make sure that it is, in fact, locked on. It's not going to blow off going down the road. Uh, we have your potable water fill here. Uh, now, that's how we're going to fill the onboard water tank if you're doing any dry camping. Uh, before you get there, you're going to go ahead and fill this up. Uh, you'll stick a garden hose directly in, uh, fill it up till it overflows. Uh, once we're full, we cap it off. Uh, we do need to use, again, that onboard 12-volt water pump to draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures and make it usable. All right, so up top here we have your speakers and your vent. Uh, we're going to get to the kind of the, the operation of the speakers, the awning, the lights, things like that uh, on the inside. But we have your hood vent here. Uh, this one in particular is a friction style. Now it is very important that we uh, make sure we open or close that during uh, use. So if we're cooking a meal, uh, we want to make sure that it's open. Uh, that way we can uh, vent that, uh, that hot air from the unit. And if we're going down the road, we want to make sure it's closed. It's going to keep any road debris or weather uh, from making its way there on the inside. Uh, dropping down low, we have the exhaust for your furnace vent. Uh, now that very important that we do let that exhaust. Again, it is, it is, uh, going to blow very hot air when it is on and it's going to exhaust from this location. It's also very important that we do not restrict the flow. You're not going to want to put a lawn chair or anything up in front of it. It does blow very hot air when it is on. Also, um, a good place for a bug screen. So this is a huge intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects. Again, it's very important that we protect them from nesting uh, within the appliance. Uh, here on the uh, the this kind of area here is going to be designed for an outside TV. Uh, you're going to go ahead and take the mount from the inside of the TV, or the TV mount from the inside of the unit, and you can slide that off the track, a very similar bracket to what you have here, and then you're going to, of course, put it uh, from the top down, sliding it in there. That allows you to go ahead and utilize any, out, uh, any TV out here uh, in this area. We have a transition for a cable uh, park cable service. We saw the inlets of those services there on the other side. Uh, this is just going to be an outlet or a pass-through connection. Then we have a couple 110 volt outlets there to power that TV uh, in the event, again, that you want to watch TV here on the exterior. Uh, standard RV style handrail is going to lock in the out position. To, uh, to fold it away, you just lift up, fold it against the body, pretty straightforward stuff there. Uh, step here. Uh, if we're putting it in, it's going to be fold up, fold, fold up and in. Uh, it's helpful if you use two hands. Uh, if you kind of use one, it'll, it'll tilt and get in a bind. And then on the way out, uh, you just pull out 
and then down. So very straightforward stuff there. Um, screen door here, uh, so you can go ahead and utilize that. Uh, connects from the uh, main entry door, uh, very easy to do. And then when you're uh, not in use, it is just uh, kind of piggyback in there on that entry door. Uh, further forward, we have, excuse me, the, the other side of your pass-through compartment. Uh, again, we have a light there. Uh, we tap that lens to turn that on and off. Uh, all the compartment doors do have this magnetic hold open, which is a great feature that's going to keep everything out of the way uh, if you are accessing this compartment. And then we do have a ZAMP style solar plug here. This is designed for any portable solar panel, uh, briefcase uh, panel or whatever uh, portable panel you can come up with. As long as it has that Anderson style plug, it will be accommodated in this location. And generally with those portable panels, they allow you to go ahead and park your unit in the shade, take your solar panel out into the sun, directionalize it as necessary, taking advantage of that solar energy without having to plug or, or park your unit uh, in the heat. Uh, so it is a direct connection to the battery. It is essentially a plug and play connection. So uh, just plug it in, set it and forget it pretty much. Uh, that just about covers it here on the exterior of the unit. We're gonna hop on the inside and start taking a look at those features. All right, here on the interior of the unit, uh, first up is going to be your step light. Now that's just going to light your entry step here. Uh, if you're you know, coming in and out of the unit at dark, uh, that's going to be an excellent uh, feature, keep you from tripping uh, on your way out of the unit. Uh, up top here, we have your uh, fire extinguisher. It's very important that we do test all of our safety equipment before taking the unit out. Uh, to do so in this scenario, we push the green tab down. If it springs back, that means we have life. Uh, if it stays depressed, that means there's no longer pressure within the unit. We're going to pull it out and replace it. Uh, we have this switch here that's going to control those fancy blue lights on the underside there of the drain board. Um, easy on-off toggle switch. Uh, coming up here to the other main light switch cluster, uh, this one here is going to be your LED light strip on the awning. And then this one here is going to be those uh, blue lights we saw on the inside of the speakers. And then this one here is going to be your courtesy light. So this is just a known switch you can hit going into the uh, unit at dark. Uh, this particular one uh, controls just about all of those ceiling lights, but you can really, uh, each light does have its own on and off switch. So you can control which ones come on uh, with that switch. Uh, awning, awning switch here, that's going to allow that awning to come in and out. Uh, you can choose how far uh, you bring that either in or out. Uh, slide room in and out switch here. Now this is a Schwintec slide out system. So what that means for us, it is very important that we operate that uh, slide out either fully in or fully out. Uh, we want to avoid short burst and partial openings. Uh, if we tend to use, use it in that capacity, it can actually bind the slide in its opening. Uh, so very important that we come fully in, fully out. Uh, coming here into the bedroom area, uh, all the windows are basically going to be the same. They're going to utilize these friction style pull down shades. Uh, also, they're going to open very similar. You have a, a locking tab here. If we go ahead and lift that out, that's going to allow that window to slide open there. Uh, when we're closing the window, we got to make sure that we are fully closed and locked on the way in. Uh, now here down on the floor on my side of the bed, we have a couple 110 volt outlets and a couple USBs as well. And then on the other side, uh, we have that same, we have that same setup as well. So 110s on both sides, as well as USBs on both sides. Uh, this window is going to differ slightly from the one we just talked about. This is going to be an emergency exit. Uh, if you're particularly motivated enough, uh, you can yank this screen out of the window and that window will come fully open, allowing you uh, to evacuate the unit from this area. Uh, now to open it and use it as a normal window, we just uh, unlatch that slider there and we go ahead and open it uh, at that far and that will allow you to of course utilize it as a normal window and then in the event of emergency you can also exit from this location. Uh, other than the cabinetry here on each side of the bed, this is all pretty basic standard stuff. Uh, you do also have storage on the underside of the bed. So if we lift that up there, we have a couple gas struts. Uh, that is a very efficient use of space. You can go ahead and, and store some stuff down there. Um, Again, a very efficient use of space. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about when we came into the unit is going to be your 9-volt smoke alarm. This is going to run on a 9-volt battery. 
It'll let you know when it needs to be replaced. Not a bad idea to keep a spare with the unit uh, in the event that it it's alarms to you uh, in the middle of the night. Bouncing around here into the the kind of the the jackknife sofa dinette area. Um, this is also a secondary sleeping area as well as kind of your dinette option with this large table here. Uh, if we are making it into a bed, we're going to go ahead and lift up uh, the front. That's going to allow that to lay down. And then if we're going ahead and making it back into a couch, we lift it up. You always have to kind of go back and, and help it on the rear, and that's going to do so there. Uh, tabletop can fold up and store behind the, uh, the jackknife sofa if you're inclined to do so. Uh, now coming back here into the kitchen area, uh, you have a double base sink here, nothing too crazy with that. Uh, very straightforward in terms of function. Our light is going to be there on the underside to help light up that, uh, that uh, space as well. We've got a couple USB chargers as well as a couple 110 volt outlets there as well. And then we come over here to your Greystone cooktop there. If I go ahead and push that button, that's going to light up your knobs here as well as give you an oven light there on the inside. Uh, now when it does come to lighting this, we go ahead and turn it to high and then we activate this igniter here. Uh, that's going to light up all of the burners and they are marked there in terms of position. We're going to also use that to go ahead and light the pilot uh, on the oven as well. Although in this scenario, we do have to hold that in. So if we hold that in and go ahead and, and activate the igniter here, we're going to go ahead and see a pilot uh, down here on the burner and it may be hard to see uh, but you can see the igniter uh, down here in this location, and that's where we're going to see that pilot light. Uh, up top there, we have your Greystone microwave, very indicative of what you would normally see with the microwave. Uh, it does have a turntable. Um, you have a couple presets here on the top, uh, time and temperature. Again, very straightforward of what you would normally see. We have your hood light and vent. Again, this is all pretty standard stuff. Uh, and then down here we have your micro monitor. Now this is going to give you a real-time readout of where your tanks and batteries sit in level of full. If I go ahead and push the corresponding buttons here uh, to the tank, they're going to indicate their level of full. Now battery is full. Battery is going to read full anytime you are plugged into shore power. Uh, to get a true readout of where your battery sits, you do need to unplug from shore power and then go ahead and test. Uh, fresh water is full. That's how we do our testing is with the fresh water system. So it is going to be full for you uh, when you pick up the unit. Uh, black water is empty as it should be, as is gray water. Uh, water pump switch here. Uh, you know that's on with the red light on and the red light is on. Uh, that's how, again, how we pressurize that potable water system and draw that water up to the fixture and make it usable. Uh, coming around here to the refrigerator. This is a Dometic refrigerator. Our display is, or eyebrow panel is going to be here on the inside. Uh, this one is very, very, very straightforward to use. Uh, you only have two modes. So if I turn it on, it's going to go into auto mode. In auto mode, it's going to look for AC voltage first. If it does not find AC voltage, it's going to uh, start to light on propane gas. And then if I want to run it on standalone propane gas, I just depress that gas button and then it will again start to light on gas. Now, other than the uh, position of the switch here, there is no indicator that it is running on gas. If it fails to light on gas, it is gonna illuminate this check light. Uh, if there is any issues with it as well, it is going to give you an audible signal uh, because you cannot see the eyebrow panel. Uh, nothing too crazy there on the inside as well. Uh, these handles you lift out and then open. Down low here, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Uh, everything you see there on the left side is going to be your 110 volt resettable breakers. Everything there on the right side is going to be your automotive blade style fuses. Uh, again, not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit. Uh, inevitably, at some point, you will change one of these uh, and it is a great idea to make sure you have a spare. Everything is clearly marked in terms of function on both sides uh, is again, uh, very usable, very easy to do so. Uh, coming up here into the TV area. Uh, now, of course, these, these Gulfstream products do not come with the television, um, but they do come with the mount. And this is that mount I was talking about that you could uh, transition from the interior to the exterior. Uh, of course, with your TV attached, uh, you could then move it on to the outside. 
Uh, you can see the tracks there. If we go ahead and put that in the corresponding bracket, uh, we'll slide that on. When it comes to locking, the, uh, locking it back in its place, uh, we're just going to make sure that we line up uh, this keeper with the corresponding uh, part and push that in until we hear that click. Uh, we have a couple 110 volt outlets to power that TV. And then this is going to correspond with your drive unit up here, which is going to be uh, not only AM, FM radio, uh, CD, Bluetooth, but it's also going to be a DVD player. So think of these as the back of your DVD player, uh, like you would hook that up at home. And then we have, again, your, some RG6 cable fittings. These are, those are going to be transitioning from the uh, exterior of the unit. If we go ahead and make the connection here on this bottom one to your television, and we have that green light on. If we go ahead and do a channel search from there on, uh, from there, it's going to use that, uh, the omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna on the roof uh, to bring in the best available uh, cable or uh, uh, digital signal, uh, and it'll give us some programming dependent on that signal. Now, if we're utilizing a park cable service, we wanna make sure that green light is off. Uh, that's going to free up that line and allow that cable signal to go ahead and bleed on through. Uh, now we have your Dometic thermostat here. Uh, this is going to be for the furnace only. Uh, if I go ahead and turn that switch to the left, that's going to uh, turn on the thermostat and then I can slide this bottom lever to, the, uh, to my comfort level. Uh, that's going to kick that blower motor on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, with a camper of this size, it would not surprise me if it went ahead and set off the smoke alarm within that first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, per Dometic, that is a totally acceptable uh, phenomenon. It, it happens because uh, the efficiency rating uh, increases as the unit burns. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes for that, uh, again, that efficiency rating uh, to go up enough to, to not set off the smoke alarm. So as long as that happens within the first 15 minutes of operation, uh, that is completely acceptable behavior. Uh, and then air conditioner settings before we hop into the bathroom and talk about that uh, is going to be done right here on the unit. If we're looking here at the gray scale, uh, that's going to be fan only. And on the blue scale is going to be actually air conditioned. If I go here through the settings, you can kind of hear those different fan, fan speeds. Uh, that's going to be, of course, high fan uh, with air conditioning. We have a thermostat here. We can control that setting within the setting. And then, of course, we have some louvers, uh, we have vents, we can really directionalize where we're going to push that air. Uh, and then, of course, we turn it off by uh, going straight towards the front. Uh, underneath this grating here, you're going to find a reusable filter. Uh, use a, a flat bladed screwdriver to kind of pry that uh, grating out. Uh, again, you're going to find the filter, you're going to take that filter. Uh, it is a rinsable filter. Go ahead and rinse it out on the sink, give it ample time to dry replace it, and then of course you can use the unit uh, from there. So here on the inside of the uh, restroom here, uh, up top here we have your vent fan. Now this is gonna help pull any condensation from the air when you are showering. You have a standard 12 volt exhaust fan with a push button there. Uh, very standard equipment, very easy to use. Uh, shower, of course again, uh, very kind of standard equipment. Uh, on off there, uh, hot and cold on the fixture, on off on the sprayer. Uh, that's going to help you conserve water consumption overall, especially hot water. Uh, six gallons of water does not generally uh, translate to an exceptionally long shower, so most of our customers find themselves uh, doing like a military navy style shower where they're cutting that water on and off throughout that shower uh, to again conserve water consumption. Uh, your shower curtain is here, and that, that is kind of like a projector style shower curtain. You bring that over here to that side, uh, and it rests in there and then to go ahead and retract it you just push in and you want to get a grip on it because it'll kind of take off on you. Uh, toilet is a pedestal, uh, a pedal style flush uh, on that toilet. It'll be a light press to fill up the bowl, uh, full press to flush. Uh, very important that we use a single ply RV grade toilet paper as well as a deodorizing chemical treatment and a tissue dissolver. All of those products are gonna be introduced right here at the toilet. You're of course going to follow the recommendations of the product you're using, but most of them you go ahead and chase with a gallon or two of water, and that's going to be sufficient until you go ahead and dump and then you start that process over. Now, 
When you're storing the unit, it's always my recommendation that you go ahead and store the store that black water holding tank with some chemical treatment on the inside. That's going to help deodorize things, uh, keep it nice and fresh again while in storage. Uh, Turn around here, uh, quite a bit going on. We have a light switch here that's going to control the light uh, within the bathroom there. So what we have here is going to be your water heater switch. The propane side of your water heater is going to be switched on here. Uh, now how this works is that red light comes on uh, with that switch. That water heater will cycle three times. If it does not light by the end of that third time, it's going to stop trying and this red light's going to stay on. Uh, now what that means is the water heater did not light. Uh, reason being is generally uh, either you're out of propane gas or you have the valve closed on the tank or oftentimes in a unit of this size, it may just have not made, the propane may just not have made its way through the line to the appliance. Uh, in the event that that happens, make sure that you, of course, have gas, make sure your valve is on. If you have both of those things, you can come in here, you can turn that off, turn it back on. It'll start that relighting process. It'll cycle another three times. Generally, as long as you've corrected the issue, uh, it will light on the first cycle uh, of the second try. Uh, also here we have your GFI outlet. Now that's going to be a resettable outlet. Uh, all of the receptacles within this unit are tied to the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, they all do. Uh, this is going to be that reset point. Uh, very straightforward uh, to do so. Uh, you're going to uh, push the black button uh, to uh, test the outlet. The red button is going to restore function. So um, keep, an event, keep in mind that if, you, if you're trying to use an outlet and it's not working, more than likely this is going to be the culprit here. Uh, other than that, uh, basically just storage here, uh, medicine cabinet, um, you know, very, very standard stuff. Um, I think that just about covers it here uh, on the inside of the Envision. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the uh, walkthrough. Thank you very much.